the point is I put all this stuff together and I try to see, well, how does this work and how does this make this happen? And how can I quantify it so that I can help Jose when he comes in? Because Jose has a different concept about what he wants to sound like. Jose is approaching the trumpet a different way than the last guy that was here and certainly differently than I am. And, and that's sort of the, the fun part for me is whenever someone comes in, whether they can play or can't play, it doesn't matter. How can I help them get to where they want to go? This episode contains adult language and adult humor. Since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults? If you are easily offended by these types of conversations, consider switching to the oboe. Welcome to the Trumpet Gurus Hang Podcast. I'm your host, Jose Johnson. My guest for this episode is K.O. Skinsness. K.O., well, he's a wealth of knowledge. Over his career, K.O. has been fortunate enough to be mentored by some of the top names in mouthpiece manufacturing, trumpet design, acoustics, and sound reinforcement. His depth and breadth of knowledge make K.O. a skilled technician and an insightful problem solver. And all of those years in the business have provided K.O. with a near endless supply of entertaining stories. So, pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin! All right, and welcome to another exciting uh, Trumpet Gurus Hang. And I am joined by uh, my very good friend um, who uh, I've known for a number of years and uh, still can't pronounce his name to save my life. So <laughs> it is K.O. Skinsness. Yeah, you got it right. That's it. Okay, got it right. Uh, uh, give me five bucks. All right, <laughs> K.O., it is a pleasure to, to chat with you again. And uh, you know we've we've gotten to to see each other, know each other over uh, typically at uh, booths at uh, one of the wonderful trumpet conventions that we uh, we tend to hang out at. And uh, you know it was always always fun talking with you, always fun checking out your gear because uh, you you have some some fantastic stuff that you rep. And um, I just I, let, let's kind of just go like to the beginning of of what made you uh such a, a trumpet geek well i think that was just when i was i started very late when i was 16 i started playing and um because my best friend who was older than me was playing the trumpet in a rock band and it seemed really cool um so i thought that'd be cool and from the beginning i was after i picked it up and realized that i couldn't play as good as him meaning can't play a high g i was going to ask you to move that no meaning <laughs> meaning can't play a high G this or that. And it was hard. I just got obsessed with the whole thing. And it was, so I probably started playing in maybe 74 and I met Johnny Madrid in 75. Okay. And so all of a sudden it was like, I want to do that. Right. Of course I never have, but it's not over yet. Yeah. There's still time. There, there's yes. always time. Well, and it, so with so I guess I guess it didn't come easy for me. Okay, it, it well, didn't come easy for me at all. Uh -huh. And my father, who was a brilliant man, he got me teachers with a teacher um, who happened to be in the Honolulu Symphony, not Don Hazard, predated Don Hazard, um, but a guy who was a great player but a horrible teacher. He taught me the smile method because this was you know a lot of years ago. Smile method. So I got a very not good start but was still obsessed and wanted to do it and got like most of us trumpet players got obsessed with, well, maybe it's a mouthpiece. Maybe it's a trumpet. I got to have this. I got to have that. And my father felt that um, whatever we were going to pursue, you had to have a good, the good tools for it. If you're trying to be a woodworker and you don't have good tools, it's going to be hard to be a woodworker. So he would do what he could to, uh, you know, get the best stuff he could get for us, you know, within reason. So within a short period of time, he got me a, Oh, I should take that back. And you're going to, if, if I get too wordy, you'll pull this out, right? Absolutely. We don't have to worry about that. Absolutely not. Oh, okay. Um, so my father was a research pathologist and we were in Hawaii and he would go to Hong Kong about four or five times a year as part of his research and colleagues in this and that. So his son wants to play trumpet. So he bought a trumpet in Hong Kong, cost 25 bucks. Hmm. And he brought it back. And needless to say, it was horrible. 
And the worst thing was the valves just didn't work and he'd try to fix it. And he didn't know anything about instruments. You know, he was a pathologist and this and that. And so I was very frustrated from the beginning. And so I've that's helped me in later years with other things. Um, and then after a while, I, you know, he realized that it wasn't a good instrument. And so we didn't go buy the most expensive instrument, but I found a used box somewhere. And I think I paid for half of it and he paid for half of it. Um, and so I started with a, at least a good instrument and probably a Bach 3C. I don't remember. Yeah. Well, yeah. And that's a really interesting conversation um, in terms of, like equipment uh obviously because of, of what you do for a living but you know there there's always the argument of does equipment make the player um and you know a great player can, will sound great on any horn but i think it's it, it's finding the the balance that yeah you do need to have uh you do need to have the skills and that's where having a great teacher comes in um, and you have to have those great examples around you. But if the gear is not optimal, then you're always going to run into some level of resistance that's outside of your control. And when I say resistance, and I'm talking about the, the good kind of resistance in the horn, but you're going to run into a, a stumbling block that, that's completely outside of your control. So, um, you know, did and you said that the, that that experience kind of helped you later in life. I mean, so what, what's kind of your take on on gear? in terms of finding you know, helping people to match their uh you know their needs and their their playing styles to to the gear that they they need to pick up well i think there's about 10 questions in that one sentence you just gave me but i th i think that um what i feel my job is is to make your gear transparent and what i mean by that is if you've got to play let's say a high b whether you're a commercial player or playing high B in a, in a symphony on a C trumpet or something, I want you to not have to think, okay, I got to push the second valve down. I got to lift my right elbow. I got to put my foot behind my other foot and I got to face the East to play that high B, you know, put my tongue. I just want you to pick up the horn, hear it and play it, which is the goal of, you know, most fine teachers as well, hear it and let your body do what to play it. And so if you make the, you're set up transparent, then you're making music. Now you still got to practice. Um, but, but that's my goal as far as the gear is concerned. And for anybody, whether they're a beginner or professional, I feel that you should get the best gear that you can afford to get. And that doesn't mean that the most expensive is the best. But, you know, everyone's got different budgets and needs and desires and willingness, you know. Um, so you get the best gear that you can get. You dial it in the best way that you can get it dialed in. And then it's up to you to make the music. Because ultimately, it's about making the music. It's not about, oh, look, I play this blah, blah, blah trumpet. It's about making good music. And you're absolutely right that some of the greatest trumpet music or any music at all that we have to listen to um, was made on really not good instruments and maybe even captured on really bad recording equipment, but there's music there and, and that's what it's about. So, you know, I do remember, you know, when I was in, uh, when I was in high school and I'd be at home, I'd have to get up off the couch and walk across the room to change the channel on the TV. Man. Right. And I had a phone. It had a wire that went to the wall, but I don't do that now. I've got a cell phone that doesn't have a wire. Oh boy. It does more than make phone calls. And I've got, you know, remotes at home and everything that way. So you can do it. You can do it the old way. You can say, you know, oh, you know, so-and-so had a Bach trumpet and a Bach three C and he played great music. And you're absolutely right. You can do it that way if you want. Um, that's what I call the traditional method of choosing gear. And if that's the way that you want to go, that's terrific, but you should turn off Jose's podcast right now and go to the practice room because you got what you want. You should go to the practice room. The other method I call the savvy method where you learn about the gear a little bit, you come up with uh, your own sort of plan on how to approach it. And I help people with that. If I can, if you know, they're willing to listen, I have certain ways to go about it, find the best gear you can afford, dial it in 
and then it's up to you. Well, that's the, that is absolutely cool. You know, it's, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's kind of like, you know, if, if, uh, if the ultimate horn was a, you know, early Martin committee, then everyone would still be playing those Martin committees, but, you know, technology has advanced and I mean, they're great sounding horns, but, but uh, you know, then again, look at who were, who were playing those horns, you know, not everybody who picked up that horn, you know, sounded like miles. So, you know, those, those are kind of uh, very interesting concepts to think about. Um, but, yeah, so let's kind of go kind of go back. Uh, you mentioned earlier. Let's, can we pause on the Martin Committee for a minute? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the Martin Committee is a horn that many people love the sound of. The general statement, I believe, about the Martin Committee is, man, that's got the coolest sound for this kind of jazz or this kind of music and blah, blah, blah. But man, it plays out of tune. And that's the problem that they have. And there have been... Uh, trumpet makers over the years that have said we're going to make an in-tune martin committee well it's not possible because a big component of the sound of a trumpet is how the harmonics interact with each other whether you have sympathetic vibrations or don't and so the out of tuneness of the martin committee is part of what gives it that sound and if you fix the intonation that's certainly doable. You know, I learned that from Cardwell. We can do that. As soon as you fix the intonation, you don't have that sound anymore. And so here's a tip for anybody who's thinking of starting a trumpet company to help you come to your senses is do not try to make an in-tune Martin committee because it's not going to work. Uh, that's, a, that's a really interesting <laughs> insight. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, trying to find, uh, you yeah, know, when you're trying to find the, the ideal ideal equipment there's always that trade-off it seems to be um and you know it's yes you can find something that, that's going to be a good you know it's going to it's going to be be more advantageous in a particular style of music and certainly you know your playing characteristics will, will help that but uh sometimes it's the things that make it so unique uh that make it stand out uh that if you if you try to adjust it it's it's going to actually take away from from the overall performance of the horn so and, and sound, look, everyone says this, but sound matters most. There's no question about that. That's what this is about. Music is about sound. Sound matters most, but you got to be able to play the notes and you got to be able to play them in tune. And if you can't play the notes because you can't play high enough or something and you can't play the notes in tune, well, then you got a problem. And so many players, and I'm not faulting anybody for this, but many players compromise on the sound a little bit because they need to play the notes and many developing players compromise on the sound with some gear that helps them play the notes and then as they improve their techniques and their skills and stuff and now playing a high c isn't impossible um now they start thinking more about about sound and how can i dial in sound and this and all that kind of stuff so so it is a trade-off um it took me a while to figure that out with working with guys but again you got to be able to play the notes yeah absolutely yeah you, you, you got to have you have to have those abilities and uh, for me the other thing that that is the missing component for a lot of musicians is you, you got to have some kind of feeling you got to put some emotion into it you know, whether oh, you're, yeah whether you're whether you're playing a, a hindemith or or you're playing you know coltrane you know, there, there's, if you don't put any soul into it, if you don't have the emotion, then it, it's not really music. It's, it's sound, it's notes, but music is that combination of the sounds that are, are produced with the intention and the emotion uh, that the, the composer and the performer want to, to give to, or have the audience experience. Right. And that's, I was really, I've been so fortunate along the way, but when I met Johnny Madrid, and again, if you haven't seen the video I did on Johnny Madrid, Jose, would you put that link in the in Absolutely. the in the notes? Didn't it's me. it's a personal project I did. And check him out. But I met him early on, and I'd go over to his house. He lived right around the corner from me in Hawaii, and he'd try to help me. It wasn't formal lessons, but we'd hang out and we'd play a little bit. But we spent so much time listening to music, and he would be pointing out, "Okay, we're going to listen to Gazo now playing lead." 
And he would point certain things out about how to play lead, how to do this, how to phrase that. And then he'd talk about, but if you're not playing lead, you're playing second, that's a different role. And you have a different way you need to support the lead player. And if you're playing third, that's another one. I remember him telling a story that he was with a buddy's band and they were in Europe and buddy fired, fired the third trumpet player for whatever buddy reason he fired him. And uh, Johnny and whoever else went to him and said, well, we got to get John DeFlone. Who's John DeFlone? And Johnny said, he's the greatest lead trump, third trumpet player that's ever lived. That guy, he, he said he could play everything. He's good lead players in that. But for third trumpet, that's the guy you want. I don't know if that's still around, that kind of thinking. It seems like it's lost to some degree. But each, each part in a, in a big band or in a rock band or in a symphony, each part has a different role and needs to be played correctly so the sum of the parts makes the great music that you're talking about. Yeah, I was actually having a conversation recently with uh, a friend who's a you know, phenomenal lead player, and we were talking about that very same concept that, you know, that as a lead player, your job is really made or broken by the rest of the section. You know, it's like you can, you can be the greatest lead player in the world, but if you don't have the supporting voices, then you're, you feel like you're kind of hung out to dry. And uh, it, it makes your job that much harder. And, uh, you know, the, every great lead player I've talked to, I know Walt Johnson has talked about this on, on the podcast. Wayne's talked about it. You know, it's the importance of having, uh, especially like the, the second player. Uh, and uh, uh, Kevin Burns talked about that in his role being the, the split lead with, with Brian McDonald and the airmen of how uh, they have to be able to support each other when one's playing lead and the other's playing second. It's like, okay, I know what I got to do to, to help make his job better and vice versa. And I think, like you said, it's a lost art. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I really feel like, yeah, we need, well, unless you want to be like the Pete Barbuti, uh, you know, fourth trumpet player, you know, that, <laughs> and I'll have to put the link to that. If you've never seen the, the fourth trumpet player, uh, skit, great. That, that is a classic. But but yeah, it is. Everybody has a role, and if that role wasn't important, then it wouldn't be there. Well, right. And if you think about this, um, a number of years ago, I did an interview before we had podcasts. Um, there was a print interview with a school music dealer, which was a companion magazine to Win Player, mm -hmm. and they were asking me because for school music, they were asking me about it. And I said, well, you know. And this is when bands were starting to get cut, right, for budgetary reasons and this and that. And I said, you know, playing in a band teaches you so many great life skills because here you are, you're working together with a group of people towards a common goal in a non-competitive environment. Now, you might be competing when you're trying to get the first chair versus blah, blah, blah. But when it comes time to the concert, you're all going for the same goal. And it's a great life skill. I mean, that's the whole movie of, uh, Mr. Holland's Opus, if you remember that movie. But but this is important because it really helps you in anything you're doing. Playing in a band. It's a band. You learn an organization and it's fun. Uh, At least it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's not supposed to be competition, but you know, sometimes it just didn't work that way because we're humans. Um, but anyway, you know, when you're talking about Johnny, uh, you know, John Madrid definitely um uh, is you know, for, for especially for those in the know uh maybe some of the younger players aren't as hip to, to john and that's why what you you did in, in terms of, of uh doing that that film for uh about his his life uh that's where it became so so important but he he definitely is one of those people that that the uh the players in the know especially the older generation players will go yeah he was one of the he was one of the all-time greats um so you said that, that you lived close to him uh, in Hawaii. Um, what are what are some of your your earlier memories of him, and, and maybe some of the more impactful uh, lessons that you learned from him? Well, a lot of it's in that. The other people say it in um, that video, but you know, he used to say, "If you can play lead trumpet, you can do anything." And that was an approach to to life and to problem solving, if you will. That also means if you can play lead trumpet you can play second trumpet because you've got the skills to learn it i guess here, here's a good uh example um johnny went out on tour 
probably with Boz. I don't remember. Boz Skaggs. And um, I went to the local music store, Harry's Music, and I was looking through all the Trumpet Method books. And I remember for you younger people, um, we didn't have the internet. And I'm in, living in Hawaii. And so, you know, you could look through some magazines if you got a some sort of downbeat or something and you heard something from this guy or that guy, but you go to the music store to see what's available. So I'm looking through all the Trumpet Method books and I find this book called Trumpet Yoga by Jerry Callett. And I'm looking through it and I, I remember I'm, I'm a young trumpet player and I'm thinking this is the dumbest book I've ever seen in my life. I can say it because Jerry passed away. I'm thinking this is the dumbest book. I've, I'm looking at it's got the pictures of his lips and I, it was expensive. I don't remember how much it was, but it was a lot of money for me at that time. I was probably six, 17 years old, maybe, but I didn't care. I took the money and I bought it because when Johnny got back, I was going to show him this stupid book and we were going to laugh about it and have such a great time. And so uh, I bought it and Johnny came back from tour and I went over to hang out. I go, John, you got to see this book. And I show him the book, Trumpet Yoga. He goes, oh, that's a great book. And I'm going, wait a minute. Right. And. I go, uh, oh, yeah, it's a great book, right? And he goes, no, 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 no. He says, you don't have to do what he says to do. You have to learn the process he used to experiment to figure out how to do what he wanted to do. The result might not be for you, but the process, that learning process. And I got that from my father also. He would have PhD students, and this, these are pathology students, high-end medical students, and they're getting a PhD in something, you know, in medicine. And for their oral exams, he'd ask them questions, let's say about architecture. And he'd tell me, he says, getting a PhD is not about learning every, all the ins and outs of the sex life of a paramecium. He said, being a PhD means you can solve problems. It doesn't matter what the problem is. Is it a problem with your car? Is it a problem with architecture? Is it a problem with whatever? That's the skill you got to mm -hmm. learn. So I had that um, learning an example all along, and Johnny played into it because he was always trying to figure out how to play better, how to play easier. He wasn't really figuring out how to get stronger. I learned that early from him too. It wasn't about getting stronger. It was about getting the technique down. And actually what I got from Penzarella said the same thing was the weaker you get, the more relaxed you get the better you're going to play the trumpet. And that's so counterintuitive. You pick up the trumpet and it's a fight, right? <laughs> I'm going to get you, right? But as soon as you learn that no, it doesn't have to be a fight, then you can try to figure things out. Ultimately, that's what everybody does. I was talking to Ollie Mitchell. Ollie Mitchell says, I don't care what method you use. He goes, you can use my dad's method, the Happy Mitchell method, Mitchell on trumpet. You can use... Claude Gordon, you can do Caruso, you can do Chicago, whatever, whatever method you want, choose one. He says, eventually you're going to figure out how to play the trumpet or you're not. You're going to make the K.O. Skinsness trumpet method that works for, for me. And that was a, a big learning thing too. And that's what I've seen because I've tried every method trying to figure it out, you know, and have been frustrated for many, many years. And I'm still frustrated as a trumpet player, but that's part of the thing. But I finally started to figure some things out. And it was a blend of all these different things. But it's really what all the, all the methods say. They all say the same thing. They all say produce the tone in the least, with the least amount of effort possible. They all have yeah. different ways to get there. But they're all saying the same thing. And once you figure that out and you watch the players that are amazing, like madrid or you know gary grant or currently pacho flores or uh, alan vizzuti um then you realize that oh yeah these guys are not they look like they're not working well because they're not yeah. they figured it out yeah yeah well you know it, it's for me i have always had that kind of um experimental inquisitive nature and um the, the, one of my favorite quotes is how you do anything is how you do everything and i think that, that's that's very similar to what what your dad was getting to about you know uh, getting into this kind of uh, creative problem solving mode 
you know, if you if you can do it in medicine, and you should be able to apply it in any aspect of your life. That now the technique may have to change. I mean, you're not going to use the the same technique to you know to remove a spleen that you would to remove a carburetor, but you know, it, it, you you have to adjust the technique for the situation, but the concepts are you know of problem solving are are consistent they're, they're throughout the board. But I think where we run into problems as as, as trumpet players is um, we get so married to the dogma of any of a particular methodology. Uh, it, it's you know, either one that we stumbled upon or one that we were taught. Uh, you know that. We, yeah, at, at a university or through your private teacher. And we become so invested in it that uh, it's sometimes very hard to question those things. And I see this on a lot of the, the internet forums or groups uh, that, that are part of a particular methodology, which is, you know, they're great because there are so many great players that have utilized those methodologies. So I know they're great, but you know, it's like if you you interject anything and say, well, you know, there's this other way you can think about it. Oh, no, 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 because, you know, this person, you know, th this teacher that established this, whether it be, you know, Caruso or Reinhardt or Adam or you know, any of the great teachers that you think about, like, well, this is what they said. So I believe this. And so I can't vary from it because and that will, you know, that would bastardize the method. And I, I think that is doing a disservice to the spirit of all of these great teachers because they all went through this experimental process and they came up with something that worked for them and they codified it. Um, and when we don't allow it to change and to grow and to breathe, then we do them a disservice and we do ourselves a disservice as well. Well, sure. And if, if the ones that have passed away and there've been a lot of them, if they had lived longer, they might've changed their approach too, as they learned more things, you know, and if not, they didn't, but absolutely. Um, you, you know, I dated an oboe player for about six weeks, six, it felt like six weeks, no, six years, but, um, and, and they are obsessed with reeds, like trumpet players are obsessed with all kinds of things, but typically a double reed player will find a teacher and that's their teacher for life might be Ray Steele in the oboe or something like that. And they don't vary from it at all, but trumpet players seem to. They study from this guy and then they study from this guy and they study from this girl and they pull little bits and pieces that work for them. The Ollie Mitchell thing, what I'm saying, where you're kind of writing your own book of what works for you and what you're really doing is just figuring it out. And sometimes you have an epiphany. And uh, here's a little tip. Uh, if anyone from the ITG is listening, um, Mike Thompson and I were talking a few years ago and we had an idea for an ITG conference and you call it International Trumpet Guild Conference Schools of Thought. And you have it be all divided up, get the people from the Claude Gordon School and from the Caruso School and from the Chicago School, right? And have all these different seminars and performances from all these different schools of thought. I'd go just to see the conversations in the bar because <laughs> now you're going to have some fun. Um, but that's it. I mean, you can learn from everybody. And that's, you know, I remember I was... Um, in Johnny's later years, when he was sick and he had moved to Atlantic City, he was playing lead at Trump's Castle. Um, I was touring with these Broadway shows and I was going to get close to New York and I was going to take my first lesson from Vince Panzarella. And I go, I said, Johnny, I said, what do I ask him? He said, don't ask him anything. Play for him and let him tell you what you need. You know, that, I mean, that made a lot of sense. I mean, I see people going to... <clears throat> A lesson or whatever and they go in saying oh i want you to teach me how to you know i want you to blah 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 and it's like well let, if the teacher's a good teacher let them tell you what you think you need to improve on and if you think it's doesn't make sense don't go back yeah well you know when i when i was teaching martial arts full-time um I, I approach I approach any lesson when I have people because I have people from all over the the country coming in to train with me from time to time, and it would always be the first question I would ask is what do you want to get out of this session, and then from there, watching and analyzing and and keeping that in mind and saying okay well if this is the result you want, then here are the things that you need to do, and 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 the laundry list down as opposed to, you know, saying, you know, 
what techniques do you want to learn or anything like that? It's about what do you want to get out of it? What's your overall theme that would make you feel like this was a worthwhile session? And providing the the resources for them to do that. And uh, yeah, I kind of took that into my trumpet playing um, when you know, I, I've been lucky enough to to study with uh, a lot of great players and teachers. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't learned a damn thing. But you know, uh, to to go in and, and just say, yeah, you know, I I just, I just want to improve. I I just want to improve my playing, and then have them listen and say, okay, well, here are the things that I think you should do. Boom, 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 and then exactly. You know, try to apply them, and if they work, they work, and if they don't work, right, move on, or you did them wrong, or who knows? Yeah, yeah, I did. But, it, but but correct me if I'm wrong. Martial arts is the same thing. There's a strength component, but it's not about strength. It's about timing and technique. Am I correct? Absolutely. That's Trouble why the playing's the same thing. Yeah, exactly. And then what you're saying about relaxing, uh, learning to relax, because it, it, tension. Uh, yeah, tension got, has a bad rap, but it's because we don't understand tension very well. We need tension, we need resistance, but we need in the right ratios and at the right points and the right times. And the, ultimately, though, it's not about how much you're putting into it; it's how much you're you're not putting into any of the process. Because the act of tension restricts movement; it restricts flow. So you have to find how much do you need so things don't fall apart. And that's where that's where the trick comes in of, of finding that that spot where you have just enough. It's a Goldilocks method, you know, just enough tension, just enough relaxation, just enough air. And I think that's why us trumpet players are just a complete basket cases for the most part, because we were always straddling that razor's edge. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, cool, man. Uh, so, yeah, I want to ask you one more question about, uh, you know, your your time in Hawaii, and, and then you say you were you were doing some uh, some touring and stuff like that. So, uh, when you were playing in Hawaii, uh, what was the music scene like for you there? Well, for me, it's different than for for the music scene there. The music scene there, um, every Polynesian show, you know, Don Ho, Dick Jensen, whatever had at least a small big band, maybe a 12, sometimes a 15 piece big band. It was swinging, there were a lot of stuff. And the Dick Jensen show um, was at this, it was called a floating restaurant. It was a restaurant on a boat that was, you know, moored and Dick Jensen played there and they had, had to be a 12 piece. It was three trumpets and two trombones and three or four saxes and rhythm section, blah, blah, blah. And Johnny, whenever he was in town would be playing lead on that. But sometimes it was Ollie Mitchell playing lead. Um, and I would, I was 16 years old and I had a motorcycle and I would go every night and I just sneak in the back and hang out and listen to the band. And so there was a lot of that going on. Now I wasn't doing any of that stuff. I had a, my own little wedding banquet and prom band and every wedding banquet and prom, remember this was before DJs had some kind of a band. And so it was, you know, we were probably an eight piece, call it a rock band. So a couple horns, trumpet, trombone, probably, and then singers and, you know, this and that. So that's what I was doing, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and, the, and the funny, and then of course, playing in, in school bands, like the jazz band in University of Hawaii. That's where um, I played with Eric Miyashiro a bunch because he was playing in that band when I was playing in that band. And Mike Lewis, who's a great trumpet player, I think he's in I think back in Hawaii now, Hawaii, New York, whatever, he came over and we played and we learned a lot of stuff. And, um, but I wasn't too much doing too much of the scene, you know, any of the shows that came in, whether it was uh, Aretha Franklin or whatever, that'd be the, the Johnny Madrids of the world and some other guys, Mike Morita, there were three Mikes, the Mike, Mike Morita, Mike Baker and Mike Lewis, who are all great trumpet players. Um, but then the weird thing was when I graduated from college, and Johnny had moved back here and I decided I'm going to come to Los Angeles and I'm going to make it big in the studio scene in Los Angeles. So I came over here and, uh, really within about, within about a month, I had a, a five night a week gig. I was running the drive through at a local Burger King five nights of the week. Cause I realized that my skills were so low. I, I'm crazy, but 
I was still going to study from people. I was going to do gigs. I could do this and that. But anyway, the point is I would go back to Hawaii, like at Christmas to visit my parents and friends that were still there. And local contractor, Al Barty started hiring me like for the Joey Heatherton show. And I did Julio Iglesias for new year's Eve. And why? Because I was from Los Angeles now. I'm a Los Angeles trumpet player. I was the same player I was when I left. But all of a sudden, the perception was different. And so, you know, like I remember doing Julio with with Eric. That was fine. Eric's playing lead. I was playing second or third. It's fine. I could handle that. But it's perceptions that are so, so strange. And so the, the scene in Hawaii was really good. Then after it was going for a while, I got to back up. My timeline's going to be off here. But they started cutting back for, you know, just budget reasons. And so when I played the Dick Jensen show, it was down to one trumpet, one trombone and one sax. And, and Dick came up to me and, but they didn't change the parts. They just put the other books away, you know? And so here you've got this lead trumpet book that's written up to high G's or whatever. And it makes no sense in a small group like that. And I remember Dick coming up to me, he says, I want you to play every note in the lead trumpet book down an octave. Well, some you couldn't play down an octave, but I got the idea. So, so that gig kind of got, went by the wayside. It wasn't the excitement that it was. So it was, I mean, that's why Johnny moved to Hawaii because he loved the environment, but there was, were a lot of gigs. And of course, being who he was, he got the pick of them and everyone was happy to have him there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it... There were a lot of great players that were rolling through the islands during that time. I mean, like you said, you know, Johnny, Eric Nishio being from, from that area, uh, you know, Gary Grant, Jerry Hay, you know, Larry Hall, all those guys. Um, man, it just had to be a crazy time for... So me. when I was in the seventh grade, I went to a private school. It was an all-boys school, and we would have... Um, dances seventh grade dances and they'd invite the girls from the girls school and there was a band that would play at the seventh grade dances named ox and that was the band that became sea wind so here i'm a kid in high school and i got jerry hay playing at our high school dance i didn't know really who was that guy sounds really good but so yeah there were a lot and you're absolutely right gary grant would come through and all kinds of people and they really came through because of johnny being there because he had opened the scene and he let them know this is really cool. Yeah. Yeah, man. It, it, nostalgia is, uh, you know, when, when we think about the good old days, I mean, I guess we're showing our age when we do that, you know, that um, it, it's so hard to go. I mean, unless you're in New York or, or LA or Nashville, um, you know, it's it's hard to go out and find good live music, you know, and, and it, it sounds like during that point in time that you, know, you you couldn't you couldn't swing a box Stradivarius without hitting a, a great trumpet player. It's starting to swing back a little bit out here, I think. I mean, the 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 younger players, meaning the guys in their 30s and 40s right now, um, you're starting to see more and more. It's not as much as before, but isolated. Like I used to go to um, Carmelo's once a week. Don Menz's band was playing there. That's where I met Howie Shear and took from him and blah, blah, blah. Um, well, now maybe there's something that's once a month. Like Dave Richards has a great band that plays and he always gets a great trumpet play, trumpet section like Javier plays a lot and uh, Eric Jovell. All, all the good young players are playing. You see more of that. And there's another club, small place called Verse L.A., and Ron Blake, great trumpet player, who's also a player with Pancho Sanchez. He's got his own Latin jazz group, and they play there maybe once a month. But you got to pay more attention. You can't just like swing your bock and hit a hit a hit a gig like you used to be able to. But it's coming back, and I like it. And the camaraderie seems to be increasing amongst the younger players as well. And yeah, and that's what we need. You know, and especially I think if anything, uh, after things were closed down for so long because of the pandemic. Uh, now that we're able to get out and, and to do things, I think we're going to see more people not, uh, well, I guess because we, we had access to everything and everybody that we became kind of, yeah, whatever, but we're going to really see, I think people 
understand the the importance and necessity of having this kind of level of, of in-person communication of of the hangs of the the jam sessions the things that we just weren't able to do for a couple years uh and you know understand the importance of it and not take it lightly and i think it, that we can we will hopefully see uh like a re- i don't want to say the golden age but like a, a return to that that really community focused uh, approach to to trumpet playing. Yeah, it's different. I mean, we can watch anyone online nowadays with whatever speakers you got. Well, let me tell you from experience. Here in uh, name somebody here in Doc Severinsen on TV was not the same as hearing him live. Same with all the greats. You hear him live, and it's a whole different thing. It's a whole different thing. I used to go. Um, Wayne Bergeron used to have a band that would play up at Vibrato, which is Herb Alpert's club. And I used to go, of course, to hear Wayne. But the other main reason I went was to hear Gary Grant playing lead. It was unbelievable. And Gary was so focused. He would be joking with this guy and joking with that guy and this and that. And Wayne would count the band off. And all of a sudden, you'd see Gary go from telling a joke to concentrated music. And it was incredible. That was the real lesson to me, aside from how much he swung and how great he plays the trumpet. It was that change in focus because you, you, he wasn't moving. He's not messing around. We're playing music now. Yeah. Yeah. And Gary, Gary is, it, 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 that sounds like Gary. I mean, because Gary is, he is a jokester, you know, and he's got that personality, but, but when it comes down to, to laying down the horn parts, he's not fooling around. It's, mm-hmm. it's strictly business. Yep. So, yeah. And, and, and like you said, you know, being in the room and that's one of the things I always loved about being at, at the conferences um, is that when you'd have a great player come up to your booth and, you know, try a mouthpiece or try a horn or something like that. Um, it's, it's a different thing than, than hearing them on stage, you know, and when they're right there, you're just a few feet away from them or you're, you're all kind of sitting around in a corner somewhere during a dead time. And, somebody just starts doing an impromptu little class for people or they start jamming or, or I, re- I remember years ago, I think it's actually the first ITG I went to. It was in, uh, in Harrisburg and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And um, it was Arturo and um, Bob Finley did just kind of little impromptu concert uh master class sort of thing and just there's like you know little notes being passed around the different booths saying oh one o'clock come to this booth and you know and it was great because the two of them just sat there and they jammed with each other just the two of them one would one would would lay down the bass line and the other is with solo over it and uh then they just kind of started talking about things and it was just it was so different than being in a concert hall and having that separation, you know, to only be a few feet away from them. It was just, you know, it, it was really kind of a game changer, especially when you can kind of uh, look at, at mechanics because I, I'm, I'm a geek for that. You know, I'm looking at how people play uh, and then hearing this, not just hearing the sound, but feeling the sound and in its natural acoustic setting. I think it, you can learn so much from that sort of stuff. Oh, yeah. And Bobby's another unsung hero of the trumpet world. You know, he's his brother Chuck, for rightly so, gets a lot of press. I mean, Chuck's amazing, but so is Bobby. He, he was just doing the A&M thing for so many years. And you were hearing him. You just didn't know it because he was on all these records. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great player. A yeah, great teacher, too. I studied with him for a little while. Well, it sounds like you've, you spent a lot of time with a lot of, a lot of great players. Yeah, you, th- you think I'd be a lot better. <laughs> well, I won't, I won't go that far. Um, so, you know, what what kind of got you down the path of what you're doing now with with Zombie? Um, Okay, we'll make a a long story medium. So, I was in town. I had a band that was. I was trying to do whatever casual I, I could do, but I had a band that was. It was a, a 70s band, and we thought we were about six months ahead of the 70s craze, but it turned out we were about six years ahead of it. But so we had a few good gigs, and we did a couple radio shows for some special events, but we did, dug a lot of trenches. And I was working at a music store, and um, 
after a while, it was clear that the the music store wasn't going to be around. And I was kind of the manager, but I didn't agree with the direction of the owner. And so it seemed like it was time to go. So I started looking around, okay, what am I going to do? Because I don't want to go back to the Burger King drive through And I still need some, some income here. I guess that was after I had done the touring. Yeah, it was after touring. So what am I going to do? Well, I was friends with Bob Reeves and... I started going over to his shop on my day off from the music store and it became clear that um, he could use some help. He had um, my best example was he had a secretary, a really nice lady um, and the phone would ring and uh, she'd put someone on hold and Hey, Bob, pick up the phone and Bob would pick up the phone and proceed to give the person directions to the shop. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't, I think Bob should be making mouthpieces or, you know, solving the problems of the trumpet world. And so I started talking to Bob and this and that and said, blah, blah, blah. So he eventually um, said, yeah, okay, come to work here. And he was very generous. He actually, I knew how much money the shop was making and he paid me. He tried to pay me more than I would accept. Actually, I forget what he offered me. And I said, you can't afford that. Let's go to here for now and see what we could do. And it was through Bob. Obviously I learned a lot of things. Um, about from his experiences about mouthpiece making and work working with players and this and that, but he introduced me to Bill Cardwell, and Bill Cardwell is the the scientist that um, put the final nail in the coffin about how to use math physics to design a trumpet that played in tune with itself below the level of human discrimination. That's a lot of words. The idea is if you have an instrument that take, for example, uh, let's use A, A440, everyone knows that. That means 440 vibrations per second. So that means that A that you're tuning to at A440, an octave above wants to be 880, octave below 220. It's a simple explanation of everything. If those notes are in tune with each other, then when you're playing whatever the fundamental is, you get the other ones to engage sympathetic vibrations and undertones also so overtones and undertones and i call that free gas because you're supplying the fundamental and mother nature is giving you this overtone series well that exists with all the notes in the trumpet you want to have as many of them as in tune with each other as you can get and that gives you this big full rich harmonic sound and it's easy to play you use less effort you get more output and Bill was the guy who figured out how you could do that, starting from scratch. And when he gave his talk at the uh, Acoustical Society, I think it was um, Earl Kent and Jody Hall, the guys from the Con Lab were there. Now, the Con Lab had five or 10 guys that were working to figure out how to do this. And they'd been working on it, I think, for two, three, four, five years, something like that. And after Carbill gave his, his presentation, I know Jody Hall went out to him and said, Cardwell, you've done in a year and a half what five of us have been trying to do for five years. Now, did anything really happen with what Bill did, aside from stuff that I've done with it and Stombie's done with it? Uh, not so much. And uh, Bill kind of felt bad about it. Steve Chenette, who was the president of the ITG for a while, said, Cardwell, you've invented a cure for which there's no disease. And he's right. Most trumpets, especially nowadays, play pretty good. And they're pretty much in tune with each other. And you can work around it in this and that. But if you play a horn that's really in tune with itself, and we've dialed in the mouthpiece to the way you play and the horn with the gap and some other things, and you live with that for a while, you're really going to get it. it, it's, it understanding it intellectually is different from really understanding it. It's like intellectually... I know what it's like to drop here and do 100 push-ups at one shot, but I don't really know what that means because I've never done it. But intellectually, I know what it is. Well, the same with your gear. It's really about 98% of the problem is getting the intonation correct. And that's what attracted me to, um, to Stomvi was that's what he was always, Big V, Vicente, um, was always going for. I think I didn't really answer your question. I went off to the side somewhere. Um, oh, it's all good. I, I, you, you can keep going on that. That's, this is great. Well, but so it was, so it was working at Bob's shop that 
I not only met a lot of wonderful players, famous and otherwise, um, but I learned a lot from Bob, which to me is sort of the, the, the traditional method. And in my opinion, Bob's made, Bob is the greatest mouthpiece maker that's ever lived. It doesn't mean other people can't make good or great mouthpieces. But if you look at what Bob did from, and he was a problem solver too, that's how he came into doing the, the alignments. He saw a problem and he saw what was going on and he used that to figure out how oh, maybe valve alignment's important. He also was the first guy, the second guy that I know of. Carol Proviance addressed the gap a little bit. Um, Carol Proviance had two different sizes. So if you have a mouthpiece, look, I happen to have one here. The shank size, Carol Proviance had two different shank diameters, an A and a B. And the A shank stuck out a little bit further than the B shank. It turned into Bob's number four and number five. Um, and then Bob took it another level and did the whole sleeve system and addressed adjusting the gap. Those two things really changed the sound of the trumpet, in, certainly in the United States and also in the world. Plus the fact that he was trained as a machinist at China Lake um, in the Navy, he had all these machining skills. So you put all that together and you put, it, put all that together back in the 60s, this guy's a trailblazer. And he did a lot of things. And I learned a lot from him and I learned a lot watching him work with players both what works and what doesn't work and then i when i met cardwell and we kind of hit it off and i started studying with bill that was a different thing and studying with bill was like studying with johnny madrid i would go over to his house usually on a saturday saturday or sunday get over in the morning he'd always want to go to breakfast Got to go to breakfast. So we go to IHOP. He'd always get the international pancakes. I'd get whatever. He'd always pay. He refused to let me pay a penny ever, only once, but that story's not important. Um, and then we go back to his office and we'd talk about trumpet things and he'd teach me things and show me some of the math. And I'd tell him what was going on at Reeves and how I was working with players and what I was seeing. And then we'd solve all the other problems of the world too. We'd talk politics and girls and all kinds of stuff and then um and then we'd always go to dinner with his wife betty and he liked to have steaks and uh and that was it and i did that probably for 15 years at that same time because <laughs> i've always been interested i've always been kind of in commercial bands rock kind of bands and i've always been interested in pa sound reinforcement and the band i had at the time um started a relationship with uh, Meyer Sound, high-end speaker manufacturers in Berkeley, California. And I started learning a lot of, from them and my friends up there. And speaker design, it's all acoustics, has a lot to do with trumpet design. And so I, and I started kind of overlapping what I was learning from them with the trumpet and putting it together. And that's really what I do the best is connect dots. I don't have enough math to do the math that Cardwell did. I don't have enough of that knowledge. I think I went through integral calculus or something in college, but you need to get into Fourier analysis and stuff like that to really get into it. I have a friend who does that when we need it. Um, but anyway, the point is I put all this stuff together and I try to see, well, how does this work and how does this make this happen and how can I quantify it so that I can help Jose when he comes in because Jose has a different concept about what he wants to sound like. Jose is approaching the trumpet a different way than the last guy that was here and certainly differently than I am. And, and that's sort of the, the fun part for me is whenever someone comes in, whether they can play or can't play, it doesn't matter. How can I help them get to where they wanna go? It's not always successful, you know, of course not. But I, I never, Yes, I have a, you, everyone has a bag of tricks, if you will, but they don't always work. I remember um, the ITG in Grand Rapids and Dwight Adams came in. Dwight Adams is a great trumpet player. I'd never met him, but I knew him because he's on the Stevie Wonder Live at Last. I think it was done in Spain and he sounds incredible. I don't think he misses a note. He's just unbelievable. He was a great, soul. it's just, and he came in and he's, yeah, trying some mouthpieces. And I go, you're Dwight Adams. And he goes, yeah. And I go, oh, I enjoy your playing. And he goes, oh, I appreciate it. So he wanted to find a mouthpiece that would work better for him. 
So I'm trying, I'm trying, I tried this, I tried that. It's just not, the mouthpiece he had was better. And I said, you know, I can't, uh, so, sometimes I can't make a mouthpiece that's better. You might have the best one for you. And he goes, oh, and he's kind of disappointed. And I had this new mouthpiece I designed and I, I was a hundred, there was no way that this mouthpiece was going to work for him from what I knew. Absolutely no way. It's not possible for this mouthpiece to work for him. So I, um, but I said, oh, what the heck? So we tried it and uh, it worked. It worked incredible. So I just learned something. It's one of my, my big rules, but I broke it. You never know. So you learn something and try to post-production figure it out and away you go. Yeah, it, it, that's the thing, you know, the, the, the concepts of, of uh, creativity and innovation, um, you know, we, uh, we, we tend to, to stop ourselves at the known, the, the, the boundaries of, of what we know, what we believe to be true, what we believe to be most probable. Uh, but the, the biggest breakthroughs come when you kind of toss that aside and you, and you go with the thing that you have the, the least confidence is going to work. That sometimes tends to be the, the solution that, that you actually were looking for. Yeah, okay. yeah, you get out of your own way. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That is, that is so, so critical. So, uh, you know, the, the, the concept of looking at, at the, uh, the trumpet playing in, in tune with itself uh, from the, the standpoint of, of the physics, uh, that, that's, that to me is just so fascinating. I mean, I can, I can certainly geek out on, on the science behind, uh, behind the horns. But I mean, it seems like there's a, a very interesting uh, combination that you guys are doing with uh, the, the technical side by the technical side, talking about, you know, the, the science, uh, the manufacturing processes, uh, and then, you know, some, some creative and innovative design concepts, which are a little bit more artistic. So, um, you know, what, what are some of the, the, the current things or the, or the things that, that, that you've, you've been involved with, with Stomby, where you, you can go kind of point out with, with moments of pride in terms of uh, its uniqueness? Uh, so so when, I, when I left Bob Reeves to go to work with Stomby, um, and I remember sitting in the front room with Bob and I don't know if he was happy or unhappy or a little bit of both, but I do remember that he encouraged me to go out and do my own thing. He says, he says, you've got some different ideas and I think you should go pursue this on your own. Now, I don't know if he thought I was going to crash and burn or what, but anyway, he encouraged me. So I came over to Stomby and that's when I really, over the, over the number of years, I really got to know Vicente. I call him Big V. Um, Big V. And he is, he's a visionary. He's really a visionary. And he would, he's not a trumpet player. He, he decided at one point uh, he was going to learn trumpet to figure out, you know, what we're all going through. I think that lasted about three months. And he said, yeah, no, I'm not going to try to do this. This is no, but, but he's a visionary and he loves, he loves all kinds of music. He loves classical music and he certainly loves Sinatra on the commercial side. And he actually is a big Beatles fan. I, I noticed how we were in an airport and the music came on and it was like they were playing yesterday or something like that. And here Vicente, who doesn't speak English, was singing along in English to yesterday. I go, you'd like Te Gusta the Beatles? And he goes, see, sí, see. Sí. Anyway, um, so he would go to the orchestra and he'd hear certain things and he'd walk across the orchestra and he'd hear the sound change and the timbres change. And he started thinking about that. And we would talk about things like that through a translator. And I would explain some of the things that I knew from my studies, not only from Bill, but from uh, Meyer Sound and PAs and how, how sound waves overlap and cancel and, and this and that. And then he, uh, he met and started working with Pacho Flores. And Pacho, who's an amazing soloist, um, and amazing might be too, not a strong enough term, he wanted more. And he said to Vicente, Vicente, the trumpet, I, 
They only write for two and a half octaves, like from F sharp to high C. Think about most classical literature. That's about where it is, about two and a half octaves. And he says, I want more. I want the whole harmonic series like everyone else has. Even the trombone, unchanged since prehistoric times, has the whole harmonic series, but the trumpets didn't. So Vig V started exploring and experimenting and doing what he does. And the first four valve horn that he made was the four valve flugelhorn. And I know that was back around 2011, 2012. And um, that was quite visionary. Although there had been four valve flugelhorns before, people like myself remember the uh, the Getzen four valve flugelhorn that Greg Adams played in Tower of Power. Oh, I had to have one of those, Greg Adams Tower of Power, till I played it and it just didn't play well. well turns out it's because it was out of tune with itself. So Vicente made the four valve flugelhorn and now Pacho, who liked to do uh, solos of guitar transcriptions, now he had the low open E. Whereas before he'd have to go up an octave. Now he had the low E. So he started playing that. And then they started with Pacho and others, they started developing all the four valves. So now we have, I think it's 11 production model, four valve trumpets, cornets, flugelhorns in different keys. Um, F cornet, G cornet, high A cornet, B flat four valve, C four valve, flugelhorns in different keys, um, corno de caccia. And the point of that is now, you're not limited to two and a half octaves. Now you can write four octaves, five octaves, depending. Javier, who's playing all our four valves, he's got close to a six octave range on his B-flat trumpet, usable range. So that is the most exciting thing. At the beginning, I didn't get it. When I heard, when I heard yeah, Vicente made a four valve B-flat trumpet, I did what everybody did. Trumpet player does, what the hell? We need a four valve trumpet for. Until I started to get it and started to hear it and started to play it. So it's kind of like um, if you've ever heard a seven string guitar, like a Benedetto guitar, even if it's got a low, low B on it, even if you only play the normal six strings, you never touch that B string. You get a bigger sound, a fuller, more colorful, lots of harmonic sound because that extra string is vibrating sympathetically along with the others. Or a, a Bosendorf for the extended keyboard piano. Even if you only play in the middle of the piano, the sound is much bigger, more harmonics, because the rest of the harp is vibrating sympathetically along with things. Well, the four valve trumpets, it's a different mechanism, but they give you the same result that you can't get out of a three valve. So every one of them has this big resonant harmonic sound and it's more gas for the same or less work and it's done it, it led me to another part of things but it's done because the air columns are in tune Vicente's always gone for that um he has his own way of getting there it's not necessarily the way I would get there but he does it his way and it works so who's gonna argue um they're in tune air columns but then they have it turns out to be the right amount of damping and I'm not a physicist, and I'm not going to try to teach a physics course. And I'm working on a, a video. I don't know when I'll get it done. And it's uh, my unified trumpet theory, resonance theory. It really turns out that this, the trumpet problem, making a trumpet that sounds good, it is easy to play, is in tune, and works for each different player, all comes down to damping. And the um, the short... Uh, thing about damping is damping is if you have a vibrating system like the trumpet is a vibrating system damping is anything that decreases the vibrations okay you're damping it the more you damp it the less the resonance okay well why would we want to damp it well because we're trying to find like you said this trade-off of where does it work for because we've got a human component different lips, different oral cavities, different amounts of pressure, different amounts of air capacity or approach to the air. So we're trying to find the balance of getting the damping correct for the player. Now there's two kinds of damping. There's mechanical damping, which is easy to understand. Put heavy valve caps on, you got mechanical damping. Uh, put a bunch of heavy braces on, you got mechanical damping. Uh, Acoustic damping is a little bit more difficult, has to do with bore size, for example, has to do with changes in bore size, 
has to do with uh, the alignment of the valves. So it turns out that valve alignment, and this is how I look at it these days, is another tool to get to, to adjust the damping. And you can use that as a tool. I've rarely seen it hurt any situation, which is how I look at it. Um, but there's other ways to adjust the damping too. Getting the gap correct is very, very important on the mouthpiece. I've been called the gap guru. Um, whether that's good or not, I don't know. <laughs> but I've been called it. I've been called other things too that I know aren't good. Um, but anyways, so to me nowadays, it's about getting the, uh, the damping correct. Now you ask, you know, what excites me? Well, it's really the four valves that excite me. We made grade three valves, no question about it. You know, everything from the Titans to the, the original V Raptor, which I was involved with and the VR2, which I was involved with and our, you know, C trumpets. And we, those are all terrific. Um, but to me and to us, the future is the four valves. Well, the, the theory, the, as you explain it, changes my perception of it. I, it, I, I guess, you know, just, just like you, it's the first time I was like, yo, Stommy's coming up with a four valve trumpet. Wow. Okay, cool. Why? And, you know, certainly like, like you, you know, I, I, my first flugelhorn was, it was a gets in a turner and I had a choice between getting a three valve and a four valve. I wanted to get the four valve because it looked cooler. Uh, but I ended up getting the three valve and later I did play a four valve and it's like, nah, nah. Uh, you know, four valve picks. Yeah. You know, yeah, absolutely. But I just didn't see the sense in a four valve trumpet. Uh, but as you explain it, it's like now I'm, I'm like, I really want to try that. I really want, and, and especially because I do a lot of commercial music and doing commercial music um, you know, while the parts are written, you know, the, the, you know, doing, doing way too much Jerry Hay stuff as it is. Uh, but, but still like if, if you're having to uh, transcribe or trans, you know, transpose something because singers are notorious for uh, let's drop this down a minor third uh it, it would be nice to have a, a little more extended range you know when when you know the tunes are are being played primarily in in you know e or d you know being able to drop down another half step that can make a huge difference uh well, yeah and and check it out you not only have that um but you've got alternate fingerings now too. If things are difficult, you got alternate fingerings to go with. The uh, the pedal notes, we don't call them pedal notes here anymore, or double pedals. They're low notes and very low notes because they become usable. There's some videos we've done with Javier and Pacho and Aaron Smith and some other guys, you know, showing that, and they become usable notes. Now, some guys, not all, some guys. Um, do better with a different mouthpiece for that or an adjustment to their mouthpiece and you got to wrap your brain around it's not just pick it up and all of a sudden you're the four valve master um but let me tell you it's a great way to i'm 64 and i want to keep learning well man the four valve is a great way for me to keep learning because it's another challenge and remember the vr2s that's my baby i don't play my vr2 anymore it's a great horn but I play the four valve because for what I'm trying to do now, it's better for me. And I learn it now. Not everyone likes it. A lot of guys come in. Ah, oh, it's kind of cool, but whatever. I get it, but it's new. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I certainly can't wait to, uh, to try one out. I'm, I'm really excited about it now that, that you've kind of talked about it a little bit more. And I, I would be really interested in it. Uh, I've been using, um, I've been using an app and I can't remember which one it is, uh, tonal, I think it's Tonal Energy. Um, and they have a, a, a harmonic spectrum analyzer on it. And I like to practice a lot with that, uh, not just looking to see if I'm in tune, but seeing where I need to be to maximize the overtones. Because, you know, sometimes I, I can play a little bit above the pitch, N not the pitch itself, but but playing a little bit to the point where, where the, the harmonics are starting to spread a little bit more and the sound becomes a little more brilliant and trying to lock into that, that kind of sound where I get a little bit more of the, the upper frequency simply because I've got to try to cut through amplified guitars you know, every time I play. Uh, so so you're, doing, you're doing the work that I would start to interrupt, but you're doing the work. You're doing the work that 
might be able to be done by a gap adjustment or a different mouthpiece or a different trumpet or all of the above. You can do the music and do the work and make great music. And that's, uh, I applaud you for taking the time to do that. That's great. Um, but my whole thing is, can we get, can we eliminate that? Right, right, and and that I guess that that was the point that was uh, that I wanted to make though with that is that the becoming aware of how that affects the sound and and the way that you play. If I don't have to think about it and if I don't have to monitor it, then it just makes it that much easier. Yeah, and I and and now I'm able to to say and to put into words. So if I'm if I'm coming to talk to you about changing my gear up. I, I would be able to say, oh, this is what I'm looking for. And I just, I want to sound brighter or I want to cut more of being able to say, I, you know, I, I want to have a little boost in this harmonic range, or I want to have this, you know, I, I'm looking for, for this kind of resonant sound, but which is a, a different way of explaining it than just, you know, I want to play louder. Right. Cause we all want to play louder. Faster and higher. That's right. You know, that's the only thing I've never been asked to make a mouthpiece for. No one's ever called me and said, uh, can you make me a mouthpiece to help me play faster? Ah, uh, well, you know, I could use one of those. I mean, maybe for flexibility stuff, Yeah. you know, if the mouthpiece gets easier, but everyone else, they sit down, they get the metronome, they practice Clarks or whatever. They deal with it on their own. Yeah. It's, it's always about, I want to play higher. That's usually at higher, longer, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, Cause like I said earlier, we, you gotta be able to play the notes. Yeah. You know, I, I remember I was at, at Bob Reeves once and let's see, my now ex-wife was working there, Jesse and a guy named Larry and John Snell, who's still there, all trumpet players in the room, Forrest Powell and myself, and I'm on the phone and we're all in the, the one room and they, they can't hear the other side of the phone call, but they hear me. And I say, and I'm talking to this guy and I go, look, the trumpet's all about high notes. These guys all stood up and they're just like, eyes are just glaring at me, right? And I just kept talking to the guy and I hung up the phone. And I think Jesse was the first one. Was, I can't believe you'd say the trumpet's all about high notes. They all, it's not about high notes. Trumpet's about making music and you commercial players. I go, guys, I was talking to a classical trumpet player. I said, he's not worried about playing faster. He's not worried about his sound. He's worried about resting for 130 measures and coming in on a high C. You got us. That's the problem we got to solve. That's the biggest problem for everybody. And yeah. if you can solve that and, and so there's, this is something I can't prove, but I believe it happened. So when I started playing trumpet late in the seventies, um, and part of it was because we didn't have the access to so many players that we have now because there was no internet. Um, we had to wait for the records to come out. There weren't that many people that could really play high well. Now, there probably were more, but again, we weren't exposed to them. And then what happened in the, I believe, the late 60s, 70s, 80s is different companies um, figured out how to make trumpets and mouthpieces that were easier to play you know, but they didn't necessarily have a great sound. Okay. They got really good resonance peaks, which made it easier to play, but the sound wasn't so great, but people started to accept that sound. Cause like I said, sound matters most, but you gotta be able to play the notes. And then it was over time that other people, um, partially from what Cardwell did, but also from Vicente and some others started figuring out can we do both? Can we make a trumpet and or a mouthpiece, actually a system that's easier to play, but has a better sound? And by better sound, I want that full, lots of colors, big harmonics, rich sound. That's a good sound to me. I don't like a real thin sound. I don't like a dull sound, which some people think is dark. Um, you know, I, I like a, a, a sound full of harmonics. And if you want to be a dark sound, we adjust things so that you get more mid and low frequencies, make it dark. If you want a really bright sound, we adjust things so you get more of the high frequencies, but you've still got those other colors. So you get a nice round sound that's more pleasant to me. And so that's certainly the goal 
the goal here and is always to, can we make it easier for you to play the trumpet with a good sound? Skewed the way you want it. You know, if you're playing lead in a big band, that's a different sound than uh, playing first trumpet in a brass quintet. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and that's, you know, even, get, even talking about like the playing lead, lead in the big band, uh, again, conversations having with a, with a guy who's, you know, a very, very good and experienced lead big band player. Can we um, know his name? Uh, yeah, uh, yes. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, when we're recording. Uh, if you go, you will go back to our previous episode because uh, this will be uh, Mr. Craig Kenny. Uh, oh, Craig, yeah, Craig, a great, great lead player. Uh, I, you know, and uh, Craig and I were talking, and uh, he he was telling me, hey, you know, I'm doing uh, doing more commercial playing. I'm getting out of the commercial world. Uh, after you know, twenty some years of, of being the lead player for Dave Stahl, mm-hmm. and uh, he's like, yeah, "It's a different gig," and he's like, "Yeah, yeah, it is." You know, it's uh, it's not that the notes, you know, the the demand of the notes are any different. Actually, maybe it's even a little less in a commercial gig than than playing lead in a big band like that. But the, your approach to the music and the sound that you need to get are different, and. Uh, you know, not not everybody can make that. I mean, the guys that are uh, obviously like the the big big name studio guys, you know, the guys like you know Wayne or you know Gary or things like that. Yeah, they can they can do a big band hit. They can do a commercial thing. They can do a, a, a classical hit. But um, you know, they do certainly. Uh, uh, they had to develop that skill. You know, they had to develop the ability to to change those languages. And it's not it's not always. Easy, it, you know, we have that tendency of thinking that, well, I just play the trumpet and I have to play it the same way in all of these these outlets, and and it's not. It, it's you have a different sound, and the and the sound is driven by, should be driven by what's in your head and your heart, as opposed to always relying on you know having to change the gear. But but changing the gear certainly helps, uh, you know, uh, at times. But if you don't have a concept of what it should sound like, then the horn changing the horn is not going to help you. That's right. Absolutely. So, I sidetracked you by asking Craig's name. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Well, Craig. I try to get people in trouble wherever I can. Yeah, not a problem. Not a problem. <laughs> I just, I wasn't sure whether, whether uh, this, this episode was going to air before or after my one with Craig, but uh, I have decided executive decision uh, that, that uh, this will air after my interview with Craig, which is already in the can. So cool. So it's it's the weird thing about pre-recording stuff, you know. You're it's like time travel, and you just never know know where you are on, on the on the quantum field here. All right, but uh, let's see. As I look at my watch here and see, holy cow, we've been talking for a while. Um, Sorry. That's oh, I, I my pleasure though. Uh, I've got uh, three segments that we need to get to. Uh, these are our standard segments, and uh, can I can I tell my uh, my possible future mouthpiece? Your well, I tell you what, we will. Uh, yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. So, I made a mouthpiece a while ago that just it was for myself, and it was too easy to play. And what I mean by that was for me, I called the French horn effects. All the notes got way too close together. I couldn't be accurate enough. It's like playing French horn. You can play a three octave scale without any of the, the vowels, right? Because they're all the notes, you have to be so accurate. And um, but it kind of opened my eyes. I thought, well, wow. It was, I mean, it, for me at that point in time, it was easy for me to go from a low A to an A above high C. It was like boom, it was like nothing. But I was always, you know, everything was too close. So I knowing what I know of and how. I'm looking at mouthpieces from an acoustic standpoint, not an airflow standpoint. I thought, I wonder if there's a way to make what I would call a double C mouthpiece. And that would not be a mouthpiece that everybody could play double C's on, but it would be a mouthpiece that was considerably easier for a high percentage of the population with a good sound, considerably easier. I'm talking 50, 60% easier. I think it's possible. 
And so I made an experimental one a few months ago for Javier Gonzalez. And he came in and we were both convinced that I'd nailed it. I, Javier plays pretty easy, but I never seen him play this easy. He was going from pedal C to triple C like nothing. And it was the best sounding mouthpiece I've ever heard of that I've made. And he plays all my gear. He sounds great. But this was like so much improved. I said, well, go take it out into battlefield conditions. So he came back and he said, the problem is I can't play loud on it. And he would play for me and he would crescendo. It, would, it sounded incredible, but he'd crescendo like a G on top of the staff. And when he got to about a mezzo forte, the me it just stopped. It didn't get flat. It just stopped. And so I go, hmm, okay, go away. So he went and thought about it. And I made a second version of it where, guess what? I changed the damping on it. And it looks like we've solved that problem for Javier on that mouthpiece. So that's the next step is, can I translate that to a big classical mouthpiece? It's not a matter of using the same backboard and the same hole size. It doesn't work that way. Um, so that's my goal. That's what I'm trying to do right now on the mouthpiece front is, can I make a, typically guys who like the flex mouthpieces say they play considerably easier than conventional mouthpieces anyway, but I want to see if I can make another step. Because I get to be one of the first ones using it. It's easier for me. Yeah, there you go. That, that, we'll see. Be your own guinea pig. That's that's, that's what right. I'm, yeah, exactly. So don't know if I can do it, but that's my goal. Okay, we got important segments. Important segment. All right, first segment. This is uh, called uh, Sound Off. This is brought to us by our good friend, Michael Barkley of Barkley Microphones. And uh, this is about approach to sound. And, we, and we've been talking about, uh, you know, definitely things from, from the gear perspective. Uh, so as we've talked about things like the, the harmonic, uh, series and the, and the horn playing in tune, um, how do you, how do you view sound, not just the role of sound, but how do you, how do you view sound, the production of sound and what are some of the critical components you would, you would say, uh, people should, should think about if they're looking to create the best possible trumpet sound that, that they can produce? Well, I think you, you've you nailed it a couple of times in this interview. You got to know what you want that to be. And that comes from a lot of listening to great players of the past, great players that exist today, um, not just on your computer, but hearing them live and coming up with a sound concept that you want. Because um, eventually, no matter what gear you play, you're going to sound like yourself within reason. You know, some gear helps you one way or another. Um, and, and that's trial and error. And you really need to record yourself on some decent equipment. And nowadays, decent equipment doesn't have to be very expensive, but decent equipment and listen back. Cause you can't, you, you can't hear yourself from behind the horn. You get, you know, what's called pie shaped hearing one, the, the pressure that you've got tends to make it more like a pie and two, um, the mid and high frequencies that are most of the trumpet are directional. They go forward. It's only the low frequencies that start to wrap around the bell where you can hear them better. Like the, the subwoofer in a, a, a home theater system, you can put that behind the couch. You can put it up front, wherever you're going to hear it because the low frequencies are omnidirectional, but the left, right speakers on your stereo, you're not putting them behind the couch. You put them on the left and the right side because they're directional. And the trumpet's mostly those mid and high frequencies. So you need to record yourself. That's why we set up the testing den of truth here, where we can actually record you and play you back through some, actually some pretty high end gear. And you can hear yourself at the same volume from the front. And I got to tell you how many people are surprised. Number one, about how loud they're playing. But number two, about, oh, it really does sound that way. I don't think I'm really helping with sound production, but I don't think you want me to try to teach people how to play the trumpet. No, well, but actually, you know, that, that's a really, uh, a really good point, though, about, you know, recording yourself. And I've, had, I've heard so many people talk about that, um, but from a different perspective. Uh, and, like, for myself, I noticed uh, when I started using in-ear monitors on gigs as opposed to using floor wedges, uh, it really changed my playing. 
because I mean, and, and I didn't go with cheap buds, you know, I had custom molds made and stuff like that. Uh, but when you hear yourself more like what's being projected out front, then it just, it, it just completely, it's like, holy cow, I had, I had no idea that that's what I sounded like out front. And instead of, it, it helped me to, to not work as hard at playing because the, I was allowing the projection, the natural projection of the instrument and the amplification to work in my favor, as opposed to trying to, to fight to play over a, you know, 18 inch China crash symbol set up at my head. So, you know, yeah, I, I really like that. And I like that idea of utilizing as part of the, um, the process, the testing process of, of gear. Yeah. And unless you have really good, um, floor wedges and someone who knows how to run them, it, it, it's, it's a losing battle. I mean, I certainly been through that a lot. And again, my relationship with Meyer sound, when we did some of the big gigs for them where they flew their, you know, half million dollar PA, like at the shrine and they had their best monitors there. And we had the best monitor guy running sound and Buford Jones out front mixing us, you know, and this and that, um, all of a sudden it was a different world because now you could hear they were wedges, but you could hear everything on the deck, but it wasn't loud. You could hear everything, but it wasn't loud. In fact, when we did, and then the front of house guy likes it better too, because he's not getting monitor wash to deal with. And when we did the, we did a gig for them up in Vegas. <laughs> That's a great, anyway, it was a, it was a battle of the PA companies. It was in the parking lot of the uh, Vegas convention center. And so Meyer was there and DNB, their great PA company was there from Germany and EAW and every, everybody was there. Blah, blah, blah. And, um, they had their latest and greatest, newest uh, monitors, the MJF-12, 212, incredible. And they had those on the on the deck for us. And we had our guy running monitors, BG Glimpse, was a great mixer. He was, anyway, great mixer. And then Buford was out front mixing the, the front of house. And it sounded so unbelievable on, on stage. I mean, I, I just can't, it was so easy to play. And um, our girl singer, and this was for all sound guys out there, right? And so we played like 12, it was a half hour presentation and we had 12 minutes of it. And they liked us because we had the rhythm section, the four horns, a girl singer, guy singer, represented all the freak, all that stuff. Um, so she's at one, the first show, she goes, man, it sounds so good up here. You guys should come hear this. And all these sound guys started coming up on stage, walking around us while we're trying to groove and play. But because that perception on the deck and you do that with really good monitors, in ears makes it easier because you've got more control, um, but but it's 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 it, it's a big deal. And an interesting side story about that: um, Lynn was going to come out because he lives in Vegas, and I and um, I got him in with some passes. And his uh, his girlfriend at the time was a lighting person, so she wanted to go to the lighting part of the show. Anyway, it's the morning he's going to come to the first show. Lynn Nicholson's going to come hear me play with my band. Yeah, there's no pressure here. And I go in the back. It's like a 10 a.m. downbeat, you know, and to do my little warm up. And dude, I couldn't play above a G on top of the staff. I mean, nothing would come out. Nothing. Nothing at all. And I had to play high Fs in 15 minutes, right? And I just went, all right, well, whatever. So I put the horn away. And I just went up on stage and did that, hear it in my head, and everything came out fine. I mean, that's, if that doesn't show you that this thing gets in the way a lot, how do we get from, to there from monitors? I, I don't know, but uh, we got, Lynn, we got the Lynn Nicholson siding in there. So that's all that matters. So. There we go. <laughs> Name dropping ding. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. Our next segment, our next segment is called geared up. Uh, and this is about all things geared. And this is a, uh, brought to us by venture mouthpieces where design technology and craftsmanship intersect use a code trumpet gurus 21 to get 10 percent off your order and uh this is you know obviously we've been talking a whole hell of a lot about gear uh but i do want to uh, just maybe dive a little bit deeper into the personalization of gear and um as you know we, there are there's a plethora of uh of trumpet manufacturers, mouthpiece manufacturers, you name it. There, there are lots of people that, that are making the products. 
Um, but regardless of what product you find, uh, I, know, I know there's a, there's that personal level of, of how does the, the the horn, how does the mouthpiece connect with you, and how does it make your job uh, easier? So, in terms of your advice as an industry guru, as one of those people who who really uh, understands intimately uh, how that interface works. And as people are getting back out to these conferences, going out to, to try try out horns, what are suggestions that you give to people to take into consideration when they're looking to change their gear? How should they approach that process in a, in a logical uh, a logical fashion that's going to give them the best results? Okay, um, let's say you're looking for a new trumpet. Uh, typically the way a guy looks for a new trumpet is they go to a music store or they go to a conference like the trumpet guild conference. They take their mouthpiece, they plug it into this trumpet, they play it, they plug it into this trumpet, they play it, they plug it into this one, they play it. They finally find one that works good enough or has the sound they like or blows them away. One of the others. And that's how they decide how to buy a trumpet. Now let's say they are looking for a mouthpiece. They typically take their trumpet and they go to this vendor and pick up a mouthpiece and stick it in and play it and try it. And they go to the next one and do the same thing next. one. That's the shotgun approach as far as I'm concerned. And odds are high in either case, you've passed by the best trumpet for you and or the best mouthpiece for you because of the absolutely most important part of this whole thing, meaning the whole trumpet gear thing, the absolute most important variable that you as a trumpet player can adjust. It's more important than the mouthpiece. It's more in trumpet, more important than the trumpet. Did I mention it's important? I, I think you mentioned it's important. The absolutely most important thing is adjusting the gap. Now, I was prepared for this. So uh -oh. if you're not sure what the gap is, if you have a trumpet lead pipe there's three of them here forget that for now and you put a mouthpiece in a trumpet it looks like that right but on the inside there ends up being this little space i'll make it bigger here the space where the lead pipe ends and the mouthpiece begins that little space the scientific term is the annulus but i don't like saying annulus more than two times in any podcast so we call it the gap the gap is so important what does the gap do Old school thinking is it adjusts the resistance that you feel as a player. Kind of. What it really does is it adjusts the relative intonation of your system. So if you take a trumpet and you pull the tuning slide out, for the most part, all the notes get flat by about the same amount. And if you bring the tuning slide in, for the most part, they all get sharp by about the same amount. So our intuition would tell us, okay, well, this is like a tuning slide. If I pull this out, it's got to change everything by the same. It's getting longer. Everything has got to get flatter. If I push it in, everything's got to get sharper. Would it only be nice if Mother Nature had made it work that way? It doesn't work that way. And if people want to look further, there's a bunch of videos that actually show graphs and stuff on uh, the Stombi web Stombi USA website and the Stombi USA YouTube channel. Um, but what it does is when you change that gap, it moves pitches around. So let's think about just the open horn. So low C, G, C, E, G, B flat, C. We'll just think about that. When you change the gap, some of those notes don't move at all. Some of them get flat. Some of them get sharp. And you change the gap some more in the same direction. Some others go back. Some come the same. Come go this and that. It's not a linear situation. So it's not like you come out and it gets better and you got to get better, 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 or the reverse. They're all shifting around. And what you're trying to do it, do as a trumpet player is adjust the gap. The gap is the correct gap is dependent on the mouthpiece, the trumpet, and the way you play. And you're trying to get the gap adjusted so you get the highest percentage of notes in tune with themselves that you can get. Let's say it's 80%. Let's say it's 90%. That's what you're doing when you're playing with your tuner, your total energy tuner, and you're adjusting your chops where on the pitch. You're adjusting where you are on the fundamental 
that's causing the other ones to be in tune with it. Problem is you got to do that on every note, right? And you're doing the work. So the gap is allowing you to line up the harmonics as good as you can get them for your mouthpiece, your trumpet, and the way you play. And the better in tune your trumpet is to start with, the better in tune and more modern the mouthpiece is to start with, the better chance you have of getting a higher percentage of notes in tune. So I, when I, when I left Bob Reeves and came over to Stombi, I wasn't going to make mouthpieces. That wasn't the plan. I was going to represent Stombi in the United States. And the reason I wasn't going to make mouthpieces was I figured everyone's just going to say I'm copying Bob Reeves. And why would I copy Bob Reeves? You know, I, but what happened was I went to Spain in December of 2008, I guess it was, and Big V wasn't there. I'd been to Spain in the factory before, but this was the first time I went by myself. I didn't have Carlos as my translator. I was there by myself. Big V wasn't there, but he had an idea. He had an idea for a cup shape, which we call the VR, the very resonant cup shape now. And, uh, he said, oh, he, he said, K.O.'s going to be here for a week before I show up. Tell him his job is to finish the rest of the mouthpiece. So he had this idea for a cup shape. And here I am dumped there and got to figure something out. And we, we started figuring things out. And I learned a lot. And some things were good. And in the beginning, the Harrisburg ITG that you mentioned you went to, that was the first one we took the flex mouthpieces to. And they were solid shank. They were all number fives. And I started seeing and hearing things that didn't quite make sense to me. For example, having worked with Bob Reeves for 14 years, I knew the difference in sound between a horn without a valve alignment and a horn with a valve alignment. I knew it. I knew it. And I would give a, a guy would come up with a horn that wasn't lined up, but I'm not doing valve alignments. I'm there selling Stombi trumpets and mouthpieces. And I would find him a flex mouthpiece. And it sounded like he got a valve alignment. Everything evened out. The colors got there and this and that. And I'm scratching my head. And Cardwell was still alive. And I went back and told him what happened. He goes, oh, you solved the damping problem. Just like that. Took me years to figure out what that meant. But so it was after that ITG. And then some more experiments that Gary Bass and I did that I won't sell a solid shank trumpet mouthpiece that I make anymore. When I go to a show, if I take 200 trumpet mouthpieces, 200 of them are converted to take couplers to adjust the gap because it's that important. You will pass up the best trumpet or the best mouthpiece if you can't adjust the gap. That's all there is to it. So if you're playing a mouthpiece that's solid shank, that's what you got. You're trying trumpets, okay, you'll find something, but you're going to end up doing work. You know, you're going to be end up doing work that you don't necessarily have to do, unless you're the lucky guy. Maybe you're, you're the lucky guy and the trumpet you find and the mouthpiece you've got with the gap that it gives you is the correct one. Okay, you're the lucky guy. But the odds of that working on a high are about, the odds of having that work for you on a consistent basis are probably the same as going to the beach out here, spitting in the Pacific Ocean, and coming back tomorrow and finding it. So if you want to be savvy, you can't ignore the gap. Thus, they call me the gap guru. Wow, that, that is amazing. And, and, I, uh, and I, I'm sorry I can go on in this forever, but I don't have a dog in the hunt. It doesn't matter to me if you've got a really large gap or a really small gap. It doesn't matter. And I remember in Hawaii, Johnny was using a Reeves mouthpiece that you could use the Reeves sleeves. And Johnny would some, I said, Johnny, what sleeves should I use? Because I don't know. I'm, Johnny's going to tell me because he's Johnny Madrid. And he says, well, I don't know. He goes, but I, I use a two sometimes and I use a five. And he said, they have similarities, but differences. Well, years later, I'm thinking, well, what's Johnny Madrid saying that a number two and a number five have similarities? Well, think about this. Let's say with a number two coupler, you get 80% of the notes in tune, 80%. You get a certain sound and a certain feel. 
Let's say with the number five coupler, you also get 80% of the notes in tune, but it's a different set of notes. Now you're going to have a little bit different sound, a little bit different feel. So what I've found is when the pitch gets right, you get the best harmonic engagement you can get by getting all those notes in tune with themselves. That's when the resistance feels comfortable to the player. So you're really adjusting the relative intonation and that gives you the feel you're looking for. I know my advice ain't the easiest unless you play a flex mouthpiece, but that's, that's where it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've heard gap. I've, you know, I have never experimented much with it. And um, I, now I think it, it's going to be, it's going to be another rabbit hole for me to, to go down but you can go down it you don't have you can go down with a ladder you don't have to just jump in the rabbit hole you right. know there's a way out um and and you can take a solid shank trumpet mouthpiece and we sell solid shank trumpet mouthpieces the ones made in spain they're great mouthpieces don't get me wrong but if you're working at the high end which is where i like to work really you know solving a problem tuning fine tuning something for a player this and that i'm not i, I just put I, I lose a whole tool if i can't adjust the gap right? It's like saying you can never do another valve alignment again. Well, that's a tool you just took away from me. Sometimes I use it, sometimes I don't. But if you have a solid shank mouthpiece, you can play with the gap, cut a piece of paper. Um, Bob used to always like saying about an inch long and maybe a quarter of an inch wide and you lay it, you lay it along the side. So when you put it in the, when you put it in the lead pipe, it's going to stick out a little bit further. It's going to be about a half coupler size and see what happens. One of three things is going to happen. It's going to get better. It's going to get worse. Or it's not going to change. There you go. And the last thing I'll say about the gap today, maybe, is don't get confused by this. So on this trumpet, the mouthpiece is sticking out this far. On this one, you see it's sticking out further. And on this one, it's sticking way out. Did that show up okay on the video? Mm-hmm. But on the inside, you end up with the same gap. Okay. So the projection, how far it's sticking out is not an is not indicative, if I can use indicative, the word indic is not indicative of the size of the gap. It's the gap that counts, not how far in or out it's going. And uh you do have a uh, more detailed uh explanations of this on your YouTube side. Am I not, am I correct in that? Yeah, the easiest one is on stompy-usa.com. You go to learn more, and there's something about the annulus slash gap, and it's all it's all laid out. Probably take you about eight minutes to watch the videos and read everything. Took me about 20 years to figure it all out, but that's okay. And then it's got a FAQ section at the bottom, which is real helpful also. All right, awesome. So just check out the show notes. There, there are links to all of uh, these wonderful resources down there. So... Uh, have a, have your annulus checked. Exactly. Yes, that's very important. <laughs> Did right. that kind of answer what you wanted about the that looking is, for gear? Yeah, that, that was wonderful. That was that was perfect. That was absolutely wonderful. All right, we have one final segment, and this has uh, very little to do with trumpet, and that's why I like to do it. And this is brought to us by our good friends at Robinson's Revenues, Kenny Robinson and the crew. Uh, this is called the Robinson's Remedy Rapid Fire Round. This is a series of uh, questions that bounce all over the place. And Who wrote the questions? Uh, it was not Kenny, I can tell you that. <laughs> so, well, I got to know who to be mad at when this is over. So, okay. Uh, it was me. It was okay. me. Okay. All right. You can take it out on me later. All right. Here we go. KO. Welcome to the Rapid Fire Round. First question for you, my friend. Who's the biggest influence on your life? That is not a trumpet player. Stan Goldstein. Okay. What's your favorite book? Do you want to know who that is or no? I, I don't. I don't. I don't even know unless you want to tell who is Stan Goldstein. So Stan Goldstein was the chief of staff at Woodstock, uh -huh. and he went on to be production manager for Rolling Stones tours, and he mixed the Doors album, and he had a lot to do with production over his lifetime, and I met him as a result of playing the trumpet. And that's where I learned a lot about PA systems and live sound wow. and how to be a wonderful human being. Wow. Great. 
Are, are you still working on it, being a wonderful human being part? Yes, that's the part that I'm having the biggest trouble with. Okay. All right. What's your favorite book? Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. What's the worst movie you've ever seen? There's a lot. Oh, geez. I got no idea. What's the worst movie you've ever been in? No, no. I've only been in one movie, so. <laughs> uh, if you weren't a trumpet player, what would you want to be? Uh, in production or in, in live production on the audio side, the sound side. What's your favorite drink? I split that between coffee and different types of wine. Okay. Uh, you have a dinner party, and you can invite any three living people, any three people in this whole wide world. Who would you have? My three closest friends. You have, you have three friends? You're doing better? Mm -hmm. My three closest. And it'd be hard to, tap, to get it down to three, but it'd be three of my closest friends. Okay. Uh, you have three additional seats at the dinner table, and you can invite any three people from history, any three people that are no longer with us. Who would you want to have? My dad. My dad, my mom, and Linus Pauling. Got to have a little physics in there, I guess. Um, all right. Uh, lacquer, plated, or raw? Oh, my choice? Lacquer. Okay. Uh, what is your favorite quote? My favorite quote? Perfection is the enemy of good enough. All right. What's your greatest fear? I don't know. I guess being mauled by Bigfoot. I don't know that I really have any greatest fear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, all right. You could be granted one superpower. What would it be? Great trumpet player. All right. Unlimited range, endurance, ability yeah. to the ability to, to leap six octaves in a single bound right but 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 more so to to make great music playing the trumpet you know whether you know it's pacho or gary grant or uh john madrid or fabio you know there's so many but being able to make great music okay all right what aspect of trumpet playing do you feel is the most overrated getting girls that's overrated. Yeah, it doesn't happen. At least oh. not in my life. <laughs> well, I mean, I th th the obvious answer is going to be high notes. Um, but I, but I, you know, All right. I don't know. High notes are exciting in the right place. Yeah. Uh, what aspect of trumpet playing do you feel is the most underrated? Sound. All right. Uh, you can go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice about music. What would it be? Study sight singing. Or sight screaming, as we used to call it. Oh, okay. <laughs> sight screeching. Uh, and while you're back there, you're going to give your younger self one piece of advice about life. About life? Start listening earlier in your life. Really listening to people. Hmm. All right. And final question for you, KO, is what do you want your legacy to be? I just want to be remembered as a good guy. Yeah. Well, it's... Uh... It's a simple thing, but uh, it's something that that uh, takes daily work, you know. And I know, and I know I'm. You're telling me that 
directly and I'm listening to you because I listen these days. <laughs> <laughs> See? See, it all comes together here on the Trumpet Gurus Hang. Uh, so, no, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's definitely, I, I think of all the things we could aspire to, that's probably one of the greatest is just, you know, just be remembered as a good person. Yeah, no matter what you do, whether you're playing trumpet or being an attorney or whatever you're doing, you can either be a nice person about it or a not nice person about it. And um, I certainly went through times in my life where I wasn't necessarily the nicest person. Um, I don't want to be that guy anymore. Wow. Nice to know that uh, you're not always an annulus. So, uh... No, thank you. But... See, see, I just... <laughs> I next time I see you, I'll give you one of our annulus t-shirts if you don't have one. Uh, I do not have one, and I will. I will certainly. Uh, I will certainly wear it proudly. So, yes. absolutely for sure. Uh, but th thanks, thanks, man. This has been great. I, I really enjoy talking with you and getting to know you a little bit better. You know, normally our conversations are are you know trying to sneak in between uh, screeching double high C's or uh, an excerpt of. of pictures of an exhibition uh it seems to be that that that's the the standards for trying out horns and mouthpieces it does seem that it varies a little bit but those are definitely greatest hits yes greatest hits uh, so once again uh you know it's always a pleasure to talk to you and uh please folks check out the links uh the resources that ko has uh they are phenomenal i have followed his stuff over the years and he does a great job of explaining uh the art and the science that goes into the manufacturing of, of all the great zombie products so uh please check him out and if you see him out and about at one of these conferences make sure you stop by and say hey because uh, he's always willing to uh to bend your ear a little bit so uh thanks again my friend and thank you very much for joining us for this episode of the hang make sure you like subscribe join uh all those wonderful things that you can do to help the hang grow and uh, until next time my friends peace and slide grease we out thanks for hanging with us today this podcast is all about creating deeper connections through our mutual love of music and the trumpet life make sure you subscribe to this podcast and also like and share this episode with a friend we want to see the hang grow for show please support our sponsors and consider becoming a personal supporter of this podcast as well Remember, for less than the price of a bottle of olive oil a month, you can keep this podcast moving smoothly. The Trumpet Guru's Hang is recorded at the Candy Factory, a co-working space and social club located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Jose Johnson is the executive producer. Post-production editing is by Mitch Bowers. Our opening theme song was composed and performed by Lexi Signal. And our closing theme music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. Incidental music is by Ethan Swayze and Jose Johnson. Graphic design by Ann Kirby of The Sweet Corps. The Trumpet Gurus Hang podcast is produced in collaboration with the So Good Lancaster Media Group. Mm -hmm.